Welcome to Turn the Page, the official podcast of the Syosset Public Library. Welcome to another episode of Turn the Page, the official podcast of Syosset Public Library. I'm Jen, your co-host for today, and I'm here with the author of a really exciting new book who has had a really uh, incredibly interesting career. Could I ask you to introduce yourself and your book, please? Of course, Jen. Lovely to see you. And uh, my name is Sam McAllister, and the book I've written is called Scoops, and it culminates in a very famous interview that I negotiated with His Royal Highness, Prince Andrew. But it's the story of my career in television news culminating in that extraordinary interview. Wow. And what a career. I mean, it's it's really fascinating. It was great to read about your journey and how you got to the point where you were able to book interviews like that, because uh, when you started your career, that was not really the track that you were on. <laughs> so I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your journey from barrister to journalist and producer and uh, how you you got here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, for people who aren't aware, barrister is the term we use here in the UK for like a court advocate. So the ones you see in those kind of like dead cat wigs, I think it's horsehair actually, Jen, but they look very strange and Victorian and something out of a bygone era. And it was my intention to be, you know, why not be ambitious? The first uh, female judge in the Supreme Court, you know, over here. Why not? You know, let's be ambitious. It didn't turn out that way. I tried it for a couple of years and I did criminal defense work with fascinating and interesting clients, but it wasn't the right match. And it's a long time in employment, right? 50 years nowadays. So you got to get it right. So I left that. I was self-employed in that role over here. I basically walked away. I sat on my sofa and I had to find something else to do for the next 45 to 50 years. So I looked around at friends who had interesting jobs and one worked in a charity, one was an academic and one worked in broadcast him at the BBC on Radio 4, which is kind of a very highbrow radio station here in the UK. And she happened to be Kismet working on a legal program. So I popped in to see her. I met the team. I spent a couple of days there. And as luck would have it, there was an opening for six weeks. And that's how it all began. Mm. I'm so glad you were uh, used the word kismet because it occurred to me while I was reading too, because so much of your story involved both, um, you know, taking very potentially scary risks and also just sort of letting yourself be guided by the people around you or, you know, things like that. And I'm wondering, um, you know, did your time in law, um, shape your approach to journalism? Uh, Did it give you a unique angle that helped you in uh, booking interviews and prepping for them? Um, Do you still find yourself going back to skills that you got in that part of your career? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I would say that the training is amazing for two reasons. It's amazing because it orders your brain in a way that means you can replicate the way that you approach things basically until the day you die, right? It gives you a discipline that perhaps sometimes you don't have beforehand. Mm -hmm. It's also profoundly important for another reason that perhaps isn't quite so pleasant, which is that, you know, in this country, there are certain preconceptions about you based on perhaps your gender, but particularly your background and your class. And I didn't have the most traditional sort of background in comparison to my peers. Mm-hmm. But the second I said, I used to be a barrister in a slightly pompous voice, straight away, that gives you a kind of door opening uh, to a credibility, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it. So the structure of the profession, the way it makes you think, I think it gives you a courage that you wouldn't have otherwise because you literally hold people's lives in your hands when you're a criminal defense barrister. So although television news feels very perilous and you are exposed to great risk, legal, of course, and factual and criticism, it never felt as perilous as holding someone's fate 
in my hands. So I think the double discipline of having done something truly frightening, to be frank, uh, and having done something that made you super disciplined and prepare relentlessly was a perfect, perfect training ground for the very tough world of television news and of the competitive world of booking interviews. Mm, that was a perfect setup for my next question because um, while I was reading your book, I noticed that the first word of your book is relentless. <laughs> and I was wondering too, if that you think was a trait that you picked up in your time training for law and then acting as a lawyer, because you really do need to um, have a lot of resilience and a lot of energy to do a lot of the things that you've done here. Yeah, you're absolutely right. I, I love the word relentless. I Sometimes it's used as an insult, I'm sure, but I see it as a great compliment because it means you don't give in. And it's very easy to give up. And perhaps the background that I came from and the message that I received as a child, which is hard work equals achievement, brackets, possibly, because there's lots of people in both of our countries who work so hard all their lives and don't manage to achieve either economic security or professional security. I know that absolutely, but I was taught that message that continuing and continuing and not giving up on yourself was really the way to be successful and if not successful, to be happy and confident. So that message of parenting that I had from my father, but predominantly my mother, really did put me in a really good position to deal with the, the absolute constant rejection, to be frank, of television news. You know, you are vilified sometimes, your phone is slammed down, people find you difficult to deal with, people have strong opinions on the work that you're doing, and 99% is rejection, to be honest. So you do have to be that word you use, Jen, resilient. Mm -hmm. and that's nature and it's nurture. And obviously my skin got thicker as I got older. And sometimes I would go and have a cry in the loo. I'm not going to lie. But mm -hmm. I did learn how to deal with that rejection and not take it as personally as I did at the beginning. Mm, that is so interesting. Um that's a good segue into the content of the book. And one of the, I think, the most interesting points that I got out of it is that um, the kind of work that you have been doing in booking and prepping for these really high profile interviews um, happens in a team. And there's lots of stuff that goes on behind the scenes and that behind the, you know, the star presenter, there are a lot of unsung heroes and a lot of people who, who do a lot of things to put these things together. What struck me is that a lot of the work is very long-term and, you know, plugging away at things for a long time to try to secure people. But then there's also a lot that happens really fast, you know, and that you have to prep for things in a very, very short term. Um, and I'm wondering, like, how does this happen, you know, in your day-to-day? -day? Like, how do you make sure that you are keeping track of like the long-term stuff and the stuff that you have to do right now for a, a thing, if that makes sense. <laughs> it makes perfect sense. I mean, you basically have to become quite disciplined and sometimes you get it wrong. I, I would get it wrong sometimes in working out what I'd call your A, your B and your C priorities. So the A priorities would be kind of like, you know, the once in a lifetime interviews like a Prince Andrew or indeed, you know, trying for President Trump or President Biden or someone of that kind of caliber. And then you'd have your kind of like middle ones that you keep kind of like trying for that maybe are not completely deluded. They might be possible and they're going to get you news headlines. And then you have your C ones, which are the ones that you might have a chance of getting um, and that you have to plug away at also. So keeping the three, or maybe even sometimes four, you've got a lot of plates in the air, keeping those going is really quite hard. And you would have to make difficult decisions in terms of continuity and priorities. Because if you suddenly get an interview in that you know is like an eight out of 10, mm -hmm. and you're still trying for a 10 out of 10, do you reject the eight in lieu of the 10? Or do you go with the eight? So you're making strategic decisions constantly. And sometimes you just get it wrong. And so you have to learn to say sorry and to admit failure sometimes, which is something I was, you know, usually quite comfortable with as I became more senior because I knew it came from a place of trying to be excellent rather than being rubbish at my job. Mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to get the credit in news to get to that position. So it's quite a fearful pursuit because if you make that decision badly, 
you could lose out on a load of news headlines, maybe even some kind of award, and you end up obviously in the firing line when it comes to your boss. So split second decisions and priorities, you get better at it, but you don't always get it right. Mm, That is so interesting. And I love that you have you know, reframed this, um, what you could see as failure or getting some stuff wrong to see it instead as trying to be excellent and or it, rather than, you know, a judgment on your ability or on your character. That's, I think that's very useful advice for, uh, you know, across situations. <laughs> yeah, totally. I agree with you. I think that trying to succeed is is a laudable aim. And whether or not you're, you know, the person who's doing the logistics, which are very difficult to do, or the person doing the editing, which often is at the last second and really frightening, or the camera person trying to get the best shot in human history. The thing you usually find in teams of people at any organization is that most people are trying to be really, really good. Nobody goes to work going, oh, I really wanna be bad at my job today. Let me be a complete loser. So I think once you understand that, you're much more compassionate towards people around you who are failing, to use the traditional word, or trying their best, as I would say. And I I always knew that I tried my best. And sometimes that didn't mean that I did well, but I had that inside myself to keep myself going when sometimes things went very badly wrong. Mm. I really like that. And I like that uh, cultivating compassion for other people can also help you be more compassionate toward yourself when you are going through these perceived failures. Um, But let's talk a little bit about these interviews, because there are so many, so many interesting stories about interviews that were um, not only hard to get, but incredibly high profile and high stakes that had huge impact on um, politics and society. what sort of skills did you have to cultivate in order to um, coax an agreement out of somebody who doesn't necessarily want to be put on in the spotlight? Yeah, I would say from my perspective, and obviously each booker has different skills, but in my case, I would say they would be empathy, number one because it's very easy to say, what do I want? Well, I know what I want. I want to get this interview. Uh, What do you want? What does the interviewee want? What are they frightened about? What do they need? What are they trying to achieve? That sweet spot. Tapping into that, I'd say, is the number one skill set. Because when it comes down to it, whether you're worth a billion or one dollar, your human element is actually the connecting element in any professional situation. That's sometimes unpopular to say, but I believe it's the truth. The second thing I would say was my integrity, to be frank, Mm -hmm. that I saw myself as an entity, Sam McAllister, even though I worked in this huge organization, I was my own product. And all I had, I would often say, was my own reputation. And I worked hard to make sure, regardless of how other people were behaving or what the assumptions were about journalism or the way that we worked, that I had my integrity and the way that I operated. And I used that as my path when I had difficult decisions to make. And the third thing I would say that was crucial, perhaps because I'm a disruptor, as we might say in common new terminology, is speaking truth to power. Because most of the people you're dealing with are surrounded by, let's be frank, sycophants, Um, either paid sycophants or unpaid sycophants, as the case may be, fans, if we're putting it more generously, or people who are blowing smoke up them. And that is one of the beauties of success, right? That you have people constantly telling you that you're incredible. (laughs) It's the biggest failure of success because you can't trust anybody anymore. Mm -hmm. So I feel often in the dealings that I was doing, people were unused to my directness and my speaking truth to power, but it was my secret weapon because they knew I was being honest and direct with them. Even if it didn't work out, they knew the cut of my jib, as we'd say in the UK. They knew what I was about. And so I think those three things were the things that made me successful sometimes and unsuccessful other times too. It's always a risk. Mm. And, you know, those traits are all very interconnected. And, you know, having a lot of personal integrity and a a strong reputation, gives you like a really good platform in order to get uh, to speak truth to power. Um, when did you feel like that was, um, let me start that question again. Was there a particular interview in which you felt that that was your, um, 
your main drive or your main reason for trying to to book the interview? Yeah, I think that effectively news journalism, when it's doing its best job, is speaking truth to power. Now, a lot of the work that news journalists do is holding politicians to account. That wasn't my specialist topic uh, in my own country, but bringing world leaders in or people who've been involved in extraordinary decision making or people who were leading other countries or people who'd made terrible mistakes or were in the news internationally. That was the group of people that I was dealing with. So I think that being able to tap into that truth to powerness, i.e. saying to somebody who's leading a country, you know, their representative, yes, we are going to ask about the situation in Palestine, or we are going to ask about how your prime minister uh, wore blackface, obviously with Justin Trudeau, you know, that we wouldn't hide behind uh, deference. So having those conversations up front as adults, and then people can walk away if the case may be, that's, that's up to them. But we would always ask the questions because otherwise you get yourself into this vacuum that's created some places, which I think is dangerous for us as consumers and dangerous for news journalism, where you're making constant kind of calibrations and you're agreeing to all kinds of things that mean that the consumers lose their trust with you. You have to be on the side of the viewer or the listener and ask the questions that he or she is itching to ask. And those questions may be uncomfortable. And if we can't ask those questions, and if we're not frank about the fact that we are going to ask them, or at least it's in the ether that they will be asked, then we're not doing our job properly. Mm, that is so interesting. Um, <clears throat> you're absolutely right that I think that staying on the side of the viewer or the listener is absolutely um, essential because the other alternative is to become another sycophant, you know, <laughs> just to be another person who is telling the powerful person what they want to hear. Um that's very seductive, Jen. I, you know, I understand it. I mean, I don't know what word you might call it. You might call it the political elite, elite in your country. We might call it the establishment here. But it has a lot to offer. You know, they have great parties. They all seem to be doing very well financially. They all hang out together. It looks like a really great situation. I mean, I haven't quite managed to get into it yet. I'll tell you when I get there. But it looks like a great club, you know. And I can understand why if you've entered that club, you don't want to start being obnoxious and rude and scoring points off of people you've just had, I don't know, a uh, party in the Hamptons with, or, you know, over here, some private members club dinner that was, you know, some party that you went to last night. So it brings benefits being part of that elite, but it brings huge disbenefits too. And I never quite hit the elite. So I had the benefit of not being part of it that I think is hugely important, actually, when trying to bring proper journalism to the world. Mm. I really I am very glad that you just brought up, um, you know, not being among the elite, because that was actually one of the parts of your story that really touched me the most personally. Um, I was also a first gen university student in my family, like you say that you are in the book, and I was raised by a single mother. Oh. Um, so I was congratulations. Thank you. It worked out very well. You know, <laughs> I'm very, very lucky. Um, so there was a lot there that really spoke to, you know, my life too. And I think it was very interesting that you talk about how your personal life has shaped your approach to your job and that, you know, you can gain a lot by being an insider, but there's also a lot of advantages to being an outsider. And that's something that I think is a very important takeaway from this book. Thank you. I really appreciate that because I think one of the things I've noticed, and in this country, we call it imposter syndrome. And I reject that phrase. I think it's really unhelpful because first of all, it creates the idea that an imposter is a bad thing. And it creates the idea that an imposter is somebody who doesn't belong. So even if you say, oh, I've, if you start saying I've got imposter syndrome, it becomes self-fulfilling. So I've always described myself as, okay, a bit of an outsider, but I see it as a huge strength because everybody else would often be talking in a similar way. They'd have shared understandings when it came to colleges that they'd gone to or educational experiences they'd had. Sometimes I didn't get their jokes. There's some joke about Socrates that I've never understood. And every time something to do with it not being written down, I can't remember. But in any event, I would never get the joke. I'd always have to Google it. And other people might feel embarrassed by that or diminished. 
But the thing I learned very early on at law school, because I'd never met a lawyer until I became one, was that that conversation is a way to make your intellect feel diminished and to make you feel that you don't deserve to be there. And I reject that. I rejected that as an idea. And my way of rejecting it was by creating my own little kingdom, sometimes just a kingdom of one, as the case may be. I was CEO of that little kingdom. And in that kingdom, I valued myself, even if those around me sometimes didn't, on the terms that I thought were important in terms of my integrity, my capabilities, and my intellect, which I'm not embarrassed about at all. And sometimes it would be different from the way they perceived intellect or how they perceived professionalism. But I had certainty in myself that I was trying my best to be good and that if they didn't see it, then I saw it for myself. And sometimes that was all you would have, right, in a professional setting. Mm -hmm. So I took great comfort in that. And I was taught that by my mother, definitely. That resilience came from her. She taught you a lot, according to this book, you know, and there was um, one phrase that really struck with me, um, which was that your mother had told you to mix with princes and paupers, you know, and to treat everybody equally. And I think that, you know, that's really connected to this, too, because I think that, you know, when you do come from the outside or when you are not as privileged as the people around you, um, the the people trying to keep you out kind of want you to be small, you know, or to, to talk as little as possible, to have as little impact as possible and just sort of be passive. And I think that all of this advice that she has given you and that you have shared with us really speaks to not making yourself small, um, not uh, bending your own desires to those of, you know, those of those around you. Um, it's really just about taking up space and about um, following your ambitions in a really pragmatic way. Um, I just think there's so much really useful advice here. And it, the book is 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 really a gift. <laughs> Jen, that's so kind of you to say you've put it so beautifully, actually. I'm actually quite moved by what you've just said. Thank you. That's very kind <laughs> and very sweet. But oh. you're, abs you're absolutely right. You know, making space for your own kind of excellence. And, you know, I'm not excellent all the time. Obviously, I mess up like everybody else. But just refusing to be diminished and sometimes that's not going to make you friends. In the nicest possible way, I wasn't looking to be the most popular person on the team. I always tried to be kind and respectful to people, even if I didn't like them. And often they probably wouldn't like me. But I never needed that kind of self-confidence that comes from being constantly liked. And I didn't need the self-confidence that comes from being constantly accepted. And I'd been taught that those things sometimes are something to be sus suspicious of, actually, because they're ways to make you conform and to make you so self smaller, just as you've, as you've put it. So I wasn't always looking to be kind of like the loudest person in the room. And sometimes I would be. And some people found that difficult and some people didn't like that. But I was certainly myself, for better or worse. <laughs> and that ultimately is all you can really offer. Right. And I never felt that I was diminished. My swearing was definitely diminished, uh, mostly. <laughs> but, but I would try and just, you know, live live the way that I'd been taught to as a child, which was to be my best self and just to kind of put myself out there. And if it didn't work out, get up and try again, maybe after a couple of drinks. <laughs> That's a, a, just a great philosophy altogether, I think. Just a great way to live your life. <laughs> um, do you think you'll ever, ever write another book? Do you see yourself uh, returning to writing anytime in the future? Oh, 100%. I mean, again, I, I make, it sounds like I'm really kind of like bold and courageous because, you know, never been a lawyer till I, till I became one, you know, mm -hmm. never written a book, only written an article. Uh, I'm actually really risk averse, which is kind of ironic, right? I like a stable, <laughs> controlled environment. I worked in news. What was I thinking? Um, but, you know, that regularity is something that I do really crave for stability. But I really enjoyed writing the book. And my publisher and my editor took a big risk on me. I'm a, I'm a, I am ai am don't say this rudely, but, you know, I'm, I'm a nobody they've never heard of before with no particular profile in the age of Instagram and influencers and celebrity to take a risk on a first time writer who nobody has heard of, who doesn't have a celebrity profile is really an extraordinary gift. And I didn't want to reject or betray that trust. So I worked my little butt off. I hope I'm allowed to say butt, uh, <laughs> writing the book to the best of my abilities. And the thing I had in mind, Jen, was that you're sitting next to me, whoever you are, and you're going through the experience with me for better or worse, failure, success, surprise, shock, horror, defeat, disappointment, whatever it is, you're next to me. I'm not a far removed individual who's 
paid a million bucks, you know, and, and does something that's removed from ordinary life. I'm you, you're me. I think you understand that in the book, you're walking with me. And so it's been very well received. I've been extremely lucky with them. Um, the reviews from strangers on Amazon and that kind of thing, which usually can be quite cutthroat. <laughs> and it's being made into a film, which obviously is a huge, you know, extraordinary thing for a first time author. So book two is looking quite likely. It actually is. And I never wanted to write a book particularly, but now here I am. Lucky, lucky me. Oh, that's wonderful. I'm so glad to hear it's going to be a film and I'm so glad you'll be writing more. And I hope that, you know, you'll consider coming back to talk to us again when you do whichever next, you know, incredibly exciting thing you're going to do. <laughs> oh, 100%, Jen. I'll be there. I promise you. That's, that's a verbal contract now. You've got it. Excellent. <laughs> okay, listeners, uh, this has been Jen in conversation with Sam McAllister, who has written the absolutely fascinating scoops behind the scenes of the BBC's most shocking interviews. Um, I strongly, strongly recommend you pick it up because it's an absolutely fascinating read. Um, it is time to close this chapter, and I will see you next time. <laughs> It's time to close this chapter of Turn the Page. Join us for the next episode.